Hello, and thank you very much for watching. My name is Franti Schultz, and I will be presenting on queer pandemics on the Gothic Fantasy Eclat. I'll be exploring the intersection of homophobia and contagion anxieties in contemporary thought, and its aversion in the works of Vernon Lee, a British ghost story writer and essayist, and in the critical and fictional work of Karl Heinrich Ulrichs, a German sexologist who also dabbled in Gothic fiction. So, in the seminal queer Gothic, George Haggerty argues that it is no mere coincidence that the cult of Gothic fiction reached its apex at the very moment when gender and sexuality were beginning to be codified for modern culture. Gothic fiction offered the one semi-respectable area of literary endeavour in which modes of sexual and social transgression were discursively addressed on a regular basis. It therefore makes sense to consider the ways in which Gothic fiction itself helped shape thinking about sexual matters, theories of sexuality, as it were. That is, the concurrence of the rise of the Gothic with the theorization of gender and sexuality and its popularity at a time when transgressive sexuality remained largely unarticulated resulted in the mode playing a significant role in the expression and conceptualization of queer experience and identity. Prior to the publication of Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, widely considered the first Gothic novel in 1764, Transgressive desire already held certain implications in the English imagination. In 1730, an anonymous writer published a pamphlet titled Plain Reasons Against Sodomy, arguing that this fashion, referring to men kissing one another in public, was brought over from Italy, the mother and nurse of sodomy, where the master is oftener intriguing with his page than a fair lady. And not only in that country, but in France, which copies from them, the contagion is diversified and the ladies in the nunneries are criminally amorous of each other in a method too gross for expression. As Haggerty notes, this tirade, which is not unique to the 18th century, implies that sodomy is a contagion that has spread from the continent, a disease that threatens the island nation like rabies or the plague and emerges from a convent. Italy and Italians, the religion, politics, culture, all combine to represent sexual transgression. Significantly, as the references to fashion and inexpressibility suggest, during this period, sexuality was conceived of as constituting behaviours rather than a coherent identity. The concept of homosexuality as an identity derived from sexual preferences had not yet been established. Language with which to articulate such an experience was not simply too gross for propriety, but simply did not exist. In the late 19th century, however, sexual identity began to be theorised with the rise of sexology, which applied contemporary scientific methods to the study of sex, gender, and sexuality. Between 1864 and 1879, Karl Heinrich Ulrichs published a series of 12 volumes collectively titled Researches on the Riddle of Love Between Men, in which he defined male same-sex desire as a congenital development, producing a feminine soul confined by a masculine body, leading to his definition of such individuals as belonging to a third sex. Ulrichs' theories laid the groundwork for subsequent theorizations that persist to this day, as Hubert Kennedy notes, one of the first to refer to his writings in print was K.M. Benkert, who later coined the term homosexual. In 1886, Richard von Krafteving popularised Benkert's term in Psychopathia Sexualis. He was also influenced by Ulrichs, writing to him in 1879 that it was the knowledge of your writings alone which led to my studies in this highly important field. However, Ulrichs, who was himself what he termed an earning or homosexual man, viewed sexology as an affront to his humanity. He complains that his scientific opponents are mostly doctors of the insane. They have observed earnings in lunatic asylums. They have apparently never seen healthy earnings. The published views of the doctors of the insane are accepted by the others. This rise of what Hubert Kennedy calls the medical or disease model of homosexuality lent scientific credence to the association between sexual transgression and contagious illness first expressed in the 18th century. Although it was often invoked to advocate the extension of civil rights to those deemed sexually abnormal on the basis that their desires were usually intrinsic and therefore natural, Ulrich's response demonstrates the resistance that at least some queer contemporaries felt towards pathological interpretations of their experiences. In the 1890s, Ulrich's concept of the third sex was adopted by Havlick Ellis and John Addington Simmons, but combined with elements of the new medical model. In 1896, Simmons published A Problem in Modern Ethics being an inquiry into the phenomenon of sexual inversion, in which he argued that not all men and women possessed by abnormal sexual desires can claim that these are innate. It is certain that the habits of sodomy are frequently acquired under conditions of exclusion from the company of persons of the other sex, as in public schools, barracks, prisons, convents, ships. 
In some cases, they are deliberately adopted by natures tired of normal sexual pleasure. They may even become fashionable and epidemic. There was, he wrote, therefore a concern in English society that a vicious habit should contaminate our youth. Concurrent with the Gothic mode's development then, there was persistent association of such transgressions with contagion. This association plays a critical role in Van and Lee's depiction of queer desire in A Wicked Voice, published in 1890, and Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady, published in 1896, as well as Ulrich's own foray into Gothic fiction, Manor, published in 1884. Catherine Maxwell and Patricia Pullen write that, for Lee, desire is always a risky business, all too often bringing death and destruction in its wake. Lee also referred to desire, and transgressive desire in particular, in terms of illness in a private journal, in which he asked herself, may there not, at the bottom of this seemingly scientific, philanthropic, idealising, decidedly noble-looking nature of mine, be something base, dangerous, disgraceful that is cousining me? May I be indulging a mere depraved appetite for the loathsome, while I fancy that I am studying diseases and probing wounds for the sake of diminishing both? Perhaps. Crucially, however, she goes on to ponder which of these two, the prudes or the easygoers, are themselves normal, healthy. In her essay, Deterioration of the Soul, she also poses the question, does society not produce its own degenerates and criminals, even as the body produces its own diseases, or at least fosters them? She conceived of sickness not as emerging from dissident desires, but from the societal obligation to resist them, whether enforced by internalised shame or legal punishment. In keeping with contemporary views on queer transgression, both A Wicked Voice and Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady are set in Italy. In A Wicked Voice, a Norwegian composer, Magnus, is haunted by the deadly but irresistible voice of an androgynous 18th century singer, Zaffarino, during his travels in Venice. Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady, meanwhile, is a doomed love story concerning a young prince and a fairy, Oriana, cursed to exist in the form of a snake for all but one hour each day. It is her transgressive nature that Albrecht is drawn to, in particular, her phallic serpentine tail, to which he responds with violent excitement. In 1890s England, the Catholic Mediterranean and transgressive sexuality were, in Hegarty's words, inextricably bound in the cultural imagination still, to the point that Gothic writers could titillate with the possibility of same-sex desire merely by evoking Catholicism, which carried, Ruth Robbins argues, heavy implications of an English and unmanly eroticism and exoticism. Diverging from traditional narratives, however, Lee does not invoke this suggestive setting in order to condemn transgressive desire as a viral threat emanating from overseas, but rather to defend it. Early on in A Wicked Voice, Magnus describes Venice as a sickly city that seemed to swelter in the midst of the waters, exhaling mysterious influences which make the brain swim and the heart faint, a moral malaria. Recalling Kevin responded with uncharacteristic rudeness to a request to play one of Zeffirino's songs, he remarks, How fearfully this cursed heat, these cursed moonlight nights must have unstrung me. This Venice would certainly kill me in the long run. What actually prompted such a response, however, was not the city, but rather his overwhelming encounter with Zaffarino's portrait. The sight of this idiotic engraving, the mere name of that coxcomb of a singer, he rages, have made my heart beat and my limbs turn to water like a lovesick hobbledehoy. While Lee first articulates Magnus's desire for Zaffarino by evoking a sickness emanating from Italy then, she simultaneously defies pathological views of homosexuality. A fast beating heart and trembling limbs can, of course, be indicative of attraction as well as illness. As her choice of the term lovesick implies, Magnus is not genuinely ill, but rather experiencing a corporeal response to a desire that he cannot admit to himself. Intriguingly, A Wicked Voice was inspired by Lee's encounter with a real portrait of Carlo Brosci, also known as Farinelli, an 18th century castrato, a male singer castrated before puberty, resulting in an androgynous voice much like Zaffarino's. While she was visiting the Accademia Philharmonica in Bologna with John Singer Sargent in 1872, she was struck by the portrait and, Ardo Haefel Thomas writes, she and Sargent had both wished that they could hear the dead singer's voice, a voice that had historically been said to have curing properties. The androgynous voice that inspired the story was associated not with infection, but with medicinal healing. It is notable then that Zaffarino is not an inherently malicious figure. Relaying the story of the death of his aunt, a procuratessa, a local named Cal Alves describes how, in life, Zaffarino was in the habit of boasting that no woman had ever been able to resist his singing. The procuratessa Lee writes laughed when the story was told her, refused to go to hear this insolent dog, and added that it might be quite possible by the aid of spells and infernal packs to kill a gentle donna, but as to making her fall in love with a lackey, never. It is not the threat of death that the procuratessa disbelieves, but the threat of desire. 
drawn to her assistance, Zafarino, who piqued himself upon always getting the better of anyone who was wanting in deference to his voice, visits the procuratessa, and, as had been forewarned, at the third air she gave a dreadful cry and fell into the convulsions of death. Significantly, though, exposure to Zafarino's charms is not intrinsically fatal. The Count states that he could kill his victims if he only felt inclined. It is not a foregone conclusion. The procuratessa died not because she desired Zafarino, but because she was resistant to that desire, much like madness. Magnus despises singing, and this distaste is explicitly tied to the corporeal. He describes the voice as that instrument which was not invented by the human intellect, but begotten of the body, and which, instead of moving the soul, merely stirs up the dregs of our nature. Yet when he awakes, after seeming to witness the procuratessa's death in his dreams, he sets out on a gondola, feeling that he was going to meet his inspiration, and he awaited its coming as a lover awaits his beloved. As he soon realises, however, it was not that theme for which he was waiting and watching with bated breath, but the sound of Zaffarino's voice. He comes to desire contact with Zaffarino, and in attempting to suppress this desire, he almost comes to meet the same fate as the procuratessa. He is sickened neither by Venice nor by his yearnings, but by his fervent, destructive denial of those feelings, a fact that he eventually partially acknowledges. He realises that Mistra, where he later travels to attempt to recover his health, was the site of the procuratessa's encounter with Zaffarino, with an odd impression of naturalness, but when he initially fails in his search for Zaffarino's voice, remarks that the silence made him feel sick. It is not his transgressive desire that makes him ill, but his inability to indulge it. After all, it is no coincidence that his symptoms upon hearing Zaffarino's voice so closely resemble orgasm. My hair was clammy, my knees sank beneath me, an enervating heat spread through my body. I was supremely happy, and yet as if I were dying. Then suddenly a chill ran through me. His trauma is not one of transgression or even of near death, but of internal insatiability, partially self-inflicted through his denial of his true self. Similarly, in Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady, after being told the legend of the Snake Lady, Albrecht sickened that very night and lay for many days raging with fever. Notably, the language with which this malady is described is much in common with the language typically used by religious bigots to condemn homosexuality. The priest who was sent for to attend him describes him as just escaped from the jaws of death and, perhaps, even from the insidious onslaught of the evil one. Yet when Albrecht learns that not only is Oriana alive, but that she is the very woman he has come to know and adore as his godmother, he almost immediately recovers, and the priest remarks that the demon has issued out of him. The following day, his limbs seem suddenly strong and his mind strangely clear, as if his sickness had been but a dream. Once he acknowledges his freedom to indulge his desires, even if he must conceal them from the outside world, his illness passes. It is also notable that Albrecht first encounters Oriana's image in a tapestry of old and gothic taste in his childhood bedroom. As in the 20th century, Lee became a prominent member of the aesthetic movement through her work on the psychology of empathy in art criticism. As Cathy Sommier to Bridges, she believed that the human animal has a biological and a bodily need for art's healthful effects. We become the beautiful through perceiving the beautiful, and perhaps even more importantly, we become healthy. The genesis of this theory is suggested in Albrecht's response to his grandfather's removal of the tapestry. He refused to touch his food for three days and began to pine away. Later, it is Oriana's brutal death at the behest of Albrecht's grandfather, who is enraged that he refuses to enter into a traditional marriage, securing a dowry that will facilitate the completion of a personal vanity project that seals Albrecht's own fate. Traumatised by her murder, he dies shortly thereafter, reportedly insane, though, Lee notes, those who approached him maintained that he had been in perfect possession of his faculties, and that if he refused all nourishment, it was from set purpose. In direct defiance of homophobic contagion anxieties, Albrecht's union with the gothic transgressive snake lady is not detrimental to his health, but rather essential to it. The fatal impact of Oriana's death on Albrecht also recalls the ending of Ulrich's manor. Manor is also geographically distant from Ulrich's place of birth and residence, set in the Faroe Islands, located equidistantly from Scotland, Iceland and Norway. During a storm, a sailor, Manor, from the island Wago, rescues the teenage Ha, a resident of a neighbouring island, Stromo, after he is thrown from a capsized boat. The boys quickly form a romantic attachment, but are separated shortly afterwards when Manor joins a two-month whaling voyage that, on its return to Wago, is driven onto the reefs of Stromo and sinks, after which Manor's lifeless body is washed ashore. He is buried that day, but the following night he appears at Ha's window, and thereafter visits nightly. During these visits, he and Ha commence a sexual relationship, and Ha is simultaneously struck with illness. Ha's mother consults a wise woman who reveals Manor's vampiric nature. 
Learning this, Ha's fellow islanders, afraid and believing that Mana's sexualized sucking of Ha's blood is the cause of his illness, impale him in his grave. Yet, as Paulina Palmer notes, this punitive act, rather than serving to release Ha from Mana's erotic spell, results, on the contrary, in keeping with the emphasis that Oryx places on the unhappy effects of sexual repression in his death. During his midnight visitations to Ha, Mana swims across the strait separating their islands in a manner that recalls contemporary perceptions of homosexuality as a pandemic that threatens to transgress borders. However, it is not those visitations that sicken her, but rather the torment of Mana's daily absence. For both Oryx and Lee, then, the Gothic provides a means of resistance to pathological vilifications of transgressive love and desire. Haggerty argues that Gothic fiction can be read as reinscribing the status quo. Gothic resolutions repeatedly insist on order restored and often on reassertion of heteronormative prerogative. In these stories, however, there is no such resolution. Magnus can never lay hold of his inspiration due to his total preoccupation with Zaffirino's voice, which he longs to hear again. And the deaths of Alberic, Oriana, Hart and Mana are presented as tragic, not comforting. In this sense, despite their sombre tone, these stories offer a radical refusal to yield to normative expectations. Their tragic endings, respectively depicting the destructive potential of sexual repression and the senseless cruelty of punishing transgressive yet harmless desires, demonstrate the injustice of the merciless prejudices with which queer individuals contended in the 19th century. So, in constructing innovative narratives that challenged conflations of homosexuality with contagious pathology, both Lee and Oryx made significant contributions to the development of a radical queer gothic, and, indeed, to the theorisation of gender and sexuality. Thank you very much for watching.